All right, let's go ahead and mosey on in to begin. We'll get started here. It's good to see everybody tonight. If you will, turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to pick up with the notes that I provided you now two weeks ago. Uh, we have one more slide to cover on that, and then we'll get into the notes for this week that Dad is passing out right now. So if you remember, just kind of to refresh our minds just a moment, uh, two weeks ago we talked a good bit in, uh, in depth about uh, the importance of being obedient in order to uh, reach the rest that has been provided by God. And the author provided us with an example of Israel while they were in the wilderness. They failed to enter that rest that was provided by God in the form of the land of Canaan due to rebellion, due to sin, due to disobedience. That's a big word that we saw over and over. Um, and so that was, he was stressing the importance, look what happened to them. We don't want to be like them, so let's be obedient so that we are able to enter into our rest that God has provided, which of course is what? Heaven. And so uh, we left off around chapter 4, verse 11, so let's pick up reading there, and we're still kind of in this discussion. He's summarizing it up for us here. Verse 11 of chapter 4, "...let us therefore strive to enter that rest." so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So there you have it. He sums it up very bluntly for us. Um, A couple of things to notice there. Obviously, he would not encourage us to not fall if it wasn't possible to fall, right? And so we've mentioned that numerous times, but I think it needs to be um, noticed uh, every time we read past that, that we need to appreciate the importance of Staying diligent uh, so that we don't fall away. Uh, Of course, he said that we would not be able to enter due to the same sort of disobedience. Um, I commented to Dad at work yesterday, I don't understand how people can say that obedience is not necessary. Uh, Just in the first few chapters of this book that we've studied, We've stressed over and over and over the importance of being obedient. Um, And so, here again, we see that if we are disobedient, we will not be able to enter God's rest. And so, again, the importance of uh, being obedient in order to enter that rest. That phrase there, strive to enter, uh, strive to enter, um, carries the idea of being eager or taking pains. Uh, It it talks about... it has the image in my head of someone that takes a lot of effort to accomplish something. I worry sometimes we're scared to say that being a Christian takes hard work. It does though, doesn't it? Uh, you think about the idea of repentance. How hard is repentance to change your mind and your attitude towards a certain way that you were living for so long to change how you think about things in order to affect your actions in a totally different way that you had been living. That takes effort. And so I I worry that we get scared of using the word work and effort. But the author of Hebrews makes it clear over and over that it takes effort and it is hard work, but it's worth it. And we need to strive to enter. We need to take those pains. We need to be eager to take those pains. Verse 12 For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes uh, of him to whom we must give an account. So on the surface, this almost, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, this almost seems out of place. It almost seems like a side note of him stressing the qualities of God's Word. But really what he's doing is he is uh, stressing uh, the importance of God's Word and its abilities in order to warn the readers, including us, of the urgency of obeying it. 
Remember what we're now coming out of, what we've talked about. The children of Israel were disobedient. And so now he is depicting us the, the qualities of God's Word and how important it is to focus on God's Word and be obedient to it. So, the first thing, the way that he describes God's Word is living and active. Um, a lot of us know people, uh, or you may have heard somebody say something along the lines, oh, I don't need to be too worried about the Bible. It's an old, dead book. How many of us in here have heard something along those lines? Well, that is obviously in sharp contrast to what's being proposed here. It is living and active. Uh, I'm reminded of the verse in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 55, verse 11. It says, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Uh, and so the idea here is that it has the ability... Uh, or the power to affect its own utterance. In other words, what God has promised in His book, you are sure that it is going to come to pass. You are sure of it. So in the context here, for us, what does that mean? If the author is saying, for those of us that are going to be disobedient, what can you bank on? You are not going to enter into God's rest. God's Word is living and active. And so when it says something, you can bet on it, it's going to come to pass. And it's going to be proven true. Now, a little side note I want all of us in here to think about. I fear sometimes we uh, don't really appreciate this quality of God's Word as being living and active. If you're like me, sometimes you've looked at somebody and you've said, you know what? They don't want to have anything to do with me uh, talking to them about what God's Word says. They're not going to pay attention to me. What's the problem there? It's really twofold, right? Who am I worried about them listening to? Me. Well, that's not, it's not about me, is it? And so what am I really doing? I'm not giving credit to God's Word being living and active. Paul described it in Romans, what, it is the power of God, right? And so, uh, we need to keep this in mind whenever we are coming across somebody that at first may seem not too interested in us uh, or listening to what we have to say about God's Word. Well, we need to let God's Word be living and active and let it use its power. And so, I want to encourage us to think about that. The next way he describes it, uh, is sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, this is certainly not the only time that God's Word has been described uh, as a sword. Uh, we see that in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, when we are being told to put on the whole armor of God, uh, and the sword of the Spirit is what? The Word of God. Uh, interestingly here, it's described with two different edges. Um, I wonder if that suggests that it has uh, twin capabilities, maybe. Uh, in other words, uh, maybe it's, uh, a wor that God's Word is a word of promise to those who are obedient, uh, those of us that would uh, strive to do what it says and enter into God's rest. But on the other side of the coin, it's a word of judgment for those who are disobedient. Um, I also think about what a sword is used for. You remember last week, uh, Rob Whitaker made a statement that really kind of stuck with me. Uh, God is a God of offense. Uh, he, tells, he tells His disciples uh, in the Great Commission what? Go out, right? And so God tells us to go on the offense. What are we to use to have as our weapon on offense? It's God's Word. But on the other side... What do we have for our defense when Satan comes along? It's God's Word. You go to Matthew chapter 4, and you see Christ uh, going through the temptation in the wilderness. And what does He use every single time? It's the Word. He quotes Scripture. And so, God's Word has at least that ability uh, for us as well. 
Next, uh, he describes uh, God's Word as having the ability to pierce to the division of soul and of spirit and of joints and of marrow. Now, that's a difficult one, isn't it? What's the difference between a soul and a spirit? Anybody? Is there one? Well, and I think that's the point. If there is one, it's not for our human brains to understand it. And I think that's really the point that the author's trying to make here. You see, where our brains don't work, where our brains can't understand, God's Word is able to understand, okay? Uh, it has the ability to penetrate the places where human knowledge cannot. Um, and so, what may be indistinguishable to us lies exposed uh, to God. Now, there's something in, in by implication that I want us to know or to appreciate about this. I struggle with sometimes um, not being okay with not understanding something. In other words, I really don't like being in a situation where I don't understand what it is that I'm faced with or understanding a certain thing in, in Scripture or whatever the case may be. Uh, you carry that out into the broader context of life. I really don't like being in situations where I don't understand why something is happening. Now, how many times has that happened to us? There, all of us have been in situations, right, where we don't quite understand what's going on, right? God's Word can help us get through that. And what we need to always remember is God is still in control. What we may not understand, God's got it in control. Uh, a little example of that was, uh, where, where were we? It was, oh, it was the singing, the congregational singing that we had back at the first of the year. And before it started, I was trying to amp up Cal. Hey, man, I, I, really, would, I really would like for you to get up there and lead a song. I'll stand right beside you. I'll help you. I really think it'd be good for you. Of course, here comes Aniston. I want to do it, I want to do it, I want to do it. And what did I say? I'm sorry, baby. That's not, that's not the way it works. Now, I'll be honest with you, for the first time in my life, I struggled with that concept. I really did. But you know what? While I, at times we go through things that may be hard to understand for us, we have to yield to what God's Word says. And so a lot of things kind of be applied to that. You have, uh, I think my wife would make an excellent teacher for everybody. She has such a way of explaining things and being patient and, and things like that. Well, that's my, my human brain talking. Guess what God's Word says? So while at times I may not understand it, I have to yield to God's Word. And so God's Word has that ability to uh, understand things and, and, and things like that, that that our brains may not be able to. Um, it also has the ability to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. How many of you in here have ever been going through something or struggling with an idea or something and you hear one of Mr. Gary's sermons, or you're reading a, a certain passage in Scripture, and it was, wow, I really needed to hear that. I think all of us have, probably. In a way, God's Word knows us better than we know ourselves at times. Um, but what I want us to really appreciate about this is, what does God has, what, how has He designed His Word to affect us? Where? In our heart. What is God concerned about? He's concerned about our heart. In other words, I can come here routinely and I can appear to all of you as having everything going well and doing everything correctly and being the good Christian guy that I'm supposed to be, but my heart could be all kind of messed up. God is concerned about our heart. And so He designed His Word to have an effect on our heart. Verse 13, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed uh, to the eyes 
of him to whom we must give an account. Uh, I don't know how that verse makes you feel. I think it can kind of strike you in a couple of ways. One, it can be an encouraging verse. Or two, it can strike fear in you. I'm reminded of the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Solomon comes to his conclusion of the meaning of life, essentially. And he says, fear God and keep His commandments. That's what's really important. Because He's going to bring everything into judgment, whether good or evil. And so there's coming a day where we're going to have to answer to God to how we responded to His Word. We're not going to be able to just sneak into His rest. We're not just going to be able to slide by and kind of wiggle our way in. No. Everything is going to be left exposed. And so... The message is, you better be obedient to what we read in God's Word, so that when we have that judgment, that we will be allowed to enter into God's rest that He has provided for us. So, that sums up those verses. That was the notes from the previous couple weeks. So if you will, let's get to our notes from this week. Uh, Let's get into verse 14 through 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, This is, uh, I think, could be described as a pivotal couple of verses here in this uh, this whole book. Uh, In in one way, it's it's a good summary to what we've just talked about, uh, being obedient in order to enter into God's rest. We have the ability uh, to be confident to draw near to the throne of God. And how are we going to do that? By being obedient. Uh, But in another way, it is also a transition uh, to one of the main themes that we're going to be talking about throughout the next few chapters, and that is the high priesthood of Jesus. To say that uh, this um, quality of the book of Hebrews um, is important is an understatement. It is probably its major contribution to the New Testament. Nowhere else do we really know anything about the high priesthood of Jesus. So if it weren't for the book of Hebrews, we would have very little, if any, information on that. And so he's beginning to really make his transition uh, into discussing this topic. So, in verse 14, he describes Jesus as our great high priest. This is the only time that this phrase is used. Uh, it's the only, way that he is, the only time he's described as our great high high priest. Now, what's interesting about that is in the Septuagint, which is again the Greek translation of the Hebrew text, the high priest is often described as the great priest. And so in a sense, what the author is saying is Jesus is our great, great priest. Now what is that saying? That seems a little awkward to our ears. But what does it mean when something is oftentimes repeated in Scripture. It's emphasizing it. It's, he's emphasizing Jesus' greatness. And so in a subtle way, he is beginning to set out the theme that Jesus' priesthood, his high priesthood, is better than the priesthood that was under the order of Aaron. So right off the bat, he is getting into that idea of Jesus being superior, there's that word, or better, uh, than the priesthood of Aaron. Uh, And so Jesus is our great, great priest. And he describes him as one who has passed through the heavens. Um, The Hebrews had in their their minds that there were several different heavens. I know of it. Paul described himself as being into, or someone, called up into what heaven? The third heaven, right? I do think in some... uh, rabbinical teachings that they would say there were as many as seven heavens? Maybe so, but what what is being described here is that Jesus has entered into 
the most holy place. The true most holy place. He has passed through the heavens and He is at the right hand of the Father serving on our behalf. Now, what's interesting is while it seems like to us passed through sounds like past tense, it is actually written in the present tense, which suggests that He is still there right now. Now, why is that important? There's a lot of times in life where things that happen in the world seem real crazy, right? Maybe for you as an individual, there are times in your life where life gets really, really difficult. I think all of us probably have gone through times like that or are going through times like that. Guess what? There has never been a time since Jesus ascended back into heaven that He has not been serving on our behalf as our high priest. And there will not be a time that He is not serving as our high priest until He comes back to deliver up the kingdom to His Father. I hope that's encouraging to you. I know it is to me. It doesn't matter what time of day, it doesn't matter when, it doesn't matter what's going on. Jesus is there, and I can have His ear like that. He's right there, at the right hand of the Father, on our behalf. In a sense, while He is reigning, He is King, He is on the throne, in a sense, He is still serving me and you. And what a wonderful thought that is. And so He has passed through the heaven... Uh, heavens, Jesus the Son of God, therefore let us hold fast our confession. Uh, this is similar to uh, what we talked about in chapter 3, uh, round about verse 6, where it says, And we are His house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence. That word confidence, uh, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, carries the idea of the boldness to proclaim what we believe. And so in a sense, it's very similar to hold fast our confidence confession, our confession of our boldness to speak about who we believe in. Uh, and so we need to hold on to that boldness. Uh, verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. In every respect he was tempted like you and I are. I've always struggled with that idea. I've always felt like there's no way that Jesus went through what I have gone through or what other people have gone through. Boy, I could not be more wrong. In a sense, Jesus has gone through a lot more than I ever could. When is temptation its strongest? It's when you don't yield to it and it just keeps on it. It gets stronger and stronger and stronger, doesn't it? At least it does in my life. It's what it seems like. When did Jesus ever yield to temptation? He didn't, did He? And so in a sense, Jesus experienced temptations at its strongest because He didn't yield to it. And so He's been tempted in every respect. He felt every human weakness and sinful compulsion and was subjected to every one of Satan's schemes. Of course, this could be a reference to what we talked about a moment ago um, in Matthew chapter 4 when the devil tempted. He came and tempted Jesus in the wilderness, and Jesus experienced every type of temptation that we go through. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily exclusively talking about that. I also think it's talking about th situations when he was in the garden. Luke describes uh, Jesus as being in agony. That word suggests a mental... A uh, struggle, a deep internal struggle. One might say a little bit of anxiety at times. Uh, and so Jesus went through very, very difficult situations, and yet He did not yield. He did not sin. Uh, it's interesting to think about uh, Him being able to sympathize with our weakness. Uh, that word for sympathize means He uh, is going to... He, he suffers with us, uh, or He makes it His own. And so, it almost sounds like empathy to me. 
Uh, he's able to empathize. Uh, he's able to feel with you and I. Again, there is never going to be a situation in your life where Jesus is not able to tell the Father, hey, let me tell you about what he's going through. The great king is able to tell the Father, I can understand that. Have you ever been in a situation in your life where you felt alone? And you felt like no one could know what you were going through? Let me tell you, I have. But guess what? Jesus is there. He is our great high priest. And he is able to sympathize with us because he was tempted in all ways as we are. And so, because of that, verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Have you ever um, been around somebody that you're afraid to approach? Or you get a little nervous of approaching? I remember um, I was, uh, I don't know how old, I couldn't have been more than six or seven years old, and we were eating at Iron Horse Grill before it burned down and before they rebuilt it a few years ago, right? And it was me and our family. We were out to eat. And for some reason, Troy Aikman starts walking across the restaurant. And I was like, my goodness, that's Troy Aikman. And so mom goes, hey, you need to go get his autograph. And I was like, uh-uh, I'm not going over there. Why? He was intimidating, right? Because he was, he was uh, famous and, and a cool football player and all these things. I ended up going over there and mom had a Super D bag for me to ask for his autograph. I'm sure that's still somewhere. And so I walk up to him and I said, hey, Mr. Aikman, can I have your autograph? He said, yeah, as soon as you take your 49ers hat off. <laughs> I was wearing a 49ers hat to ask the Cowboys quarterback. But anyway, the point is, I was intimidated. How much more should we or could we be intimidated to approach the throne of the Almighty? It's interesting when you look, uh, especially throughout the Old Testament, what happens when people are broached with the presence of the Almighty? They're fearful. They shake. But now, because of Jesus, because of our great high priest, not only are we able to enter into the presence of the throne room, we can do it with confidence, with boldness. That, again, that word for confidence carries the idea of, of speaking whatever, being able to say whatever. Have you, ever, have you ever been in a situation where you were scared to say something to somebody? I have. I remember growing up, if I did something wrong... I know, especially now, I know Dad knew exactly what I had done. But I was scared to tell him. There is never a time where we have to be scared about telling God something. We can enter into that throne room with confidence. We can draw near to God. And so this idea of drawing near, I think, is, is, is of great comfort. This is the first time of... Probably, I forgot to count them, but six or seven times that this idea of drawing near to God is found in the book of Hebrews. And so it is something that is, of course, mentioned uh, over and over. And so, Jesus is our great high priest. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. Now, so, if, if this high priest that has been appointed from among men, on behalf of men, has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, who are we talking about? We're talking about the Aaronic priest, right? We're certainly not talking about Jesus, our great high priest. He did not have sins that he had to offer his own sacrifice for. And so he has made a transition to describe the form and function of the high priesthood under the order of Aaron or under the Mosaic law. Verse 4, And no one takes this honor for himself, 
uh, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. Uh, and so, uh, really what he's doing, uh, he's trying to impress on the people that it's always been God's intention to have a mediator, to have a go-between, to provide access between the people and himself. He formed this priesthood in order to provide access for the people in order to have access to himself. Uh, and so he is reminding the, the people, uh, the readers of this book, uh, about what the high priest uh, looked like and what they did. And so a couple of things you notice, uh, he was chosen from among men, uh, and he was appointed to act in behalf of men in relation to God. Uh, and so really the high priest was one who uh, represented man to God. And so, of course, because of that, he had to be chosen from among men. And what better person to help uh, give us access to God than someone who was chosen from among us and had the same weaknesses and same qualities uh, that we do. And so he was chosen from among men. Uh, he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward. Uh, this word for deal gently, um, I think, is used only here uh, in the whole New Testament, if I'm not mistaken. What I do know is that there is no one English word to really describe this dealing gently. Uh, probably the best way to think about it is an example from the Old Testament. In Numbers chapter 14, you have the spies that have gone into the land of Canaan. They came back. Two of them gave a good report. Ten of them said, no, we can't do it. And so the people were in an uproar, they were, they were scared, they were worried. And in Numbers chapter 14 it says they grumbled or complained against Moses and Aaron. Now what was the response of Moses and Aaron? First, they fell down before the people. Secondly, what did God say? God said, you know what, I'm going to scratch them, I'm going to start over. And what does Moses do? He deals gently with them. He intercedes on their behalf and says, Lord, don't do that. Be patient with them. He prays for them. He, he talks to God about them. And so really the idea of dealing gently here carries with it. Moses and Aaron absolutely had the right to say, yep, you're right, God. Go ahead, take it upon yourself. Wipe them clean. But he didn't. He begged God to be patient and forgive them. And so it really kind of carries the idea that the high priest often had the right, maybe, to not deal gently and to condemn the actions of the people, but he didn't. He dealt gently with them. And so, of course, that applies how much more to our great high priest, who absolutely has the right. He didn't have to empty himself and come to heaven, did he? but He dealt gently with us. Now, I want to make an application to you and I. I worry sometimes we don't deal gently with each other, do we? I fear sometimes we may take an opportunity to kind of not be as forgiving as we should be. Now, I'm not saying from personal experience, uh, I've not dealt with that on either side of the coin. But I hope all of us realize that Jesus is dealing gently with us, therefore we are to deal gently uh, with each other. Uh, so, the high priest, uh, one of the biggest differences between the uh, priest, high priest under the order of Aaron and Jesus was he had to offer, sin, offer sacrifices for his own sins. And that will be something that is developed in great detail uh, later on. Verse 4, And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. Interestingly, by the time you get to the life of Christ, you see a very different form of the high priest. Uh, it had become corrupt. It had become not a good situation. I would like to propose to you, I know the reason why. By the time you get to the life of Christ, who is choosing who the high priest is? It's not according to God. It's Rome. Rome was the one that was picking who the high priest was. What does that tell you and I? The further you get away from God's plan and God's design, the more it's going to be messed up. 
it's going to be bad. And you can see that in the corruptness of the high priesthood by the time that Jesus comes on the scene. So, verse 5, So also Christ did not exalt Himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by Him who said to Him, You are My Son, today I have begotten you. That is a quote again from Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, as He says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Um, interestingly here, I think there's a subtle... Um, a subtle teaching here that suggests that Jesus is serving as king and priest. Psalm 2 was a kingship psalm. It was often quoted to a Davidic uh, on the day that a Davidic king would be uh, enthroned as king over Israel. And so, of course, who is our king? Jesus. But he is also a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Never in the Old Testament was one person able to fulfill both of those roles. It was tried a couple of times, and every time it was met with tragic results. But Jesus is able to be our King and our High Priest. Verse 7, In the days of His flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to Him who was able to save Him from death. And He was heard because of His reverence. Although He was a son, He learned obedience through what He suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey Him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 7 most likely is going to be a reference to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, when you go back and you read the different accounts of the Gospel, not one of them mention loud cries and tears. But, most likely, again, this is probably a reference to uh, Gethsemane. And so he offered up prayers and supplications to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Now, how was Jesus heard? He was heard by the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard. Did God save him from death? God heard him. And so the conclusion can be, I think, really two ways to make sense of Jesus being heard. One, he heard him and didn't respond in the way that maybe Jesus was asking him to. Jesus said, let this cup pass from me, right? Was there a way for men to be saved without Jesus going to the cross? The answer was no. And so, I think we need to remember that. If God was able to tell His Son, no... How much more is He going to be able to tell us no? Of course He will. I would also like to suggest to, you, suggest to you maybe another way that He was heard. Maybe He wasn't uh, delivered or saved from suffering or from death, but He was delivered through suffering and through death. How was Jesus exalted? It was only through His suffering. And so possibly that, that could be one way in Jesus... Uh, in, in which Jesus was heard as well. Uh, he was a son, although He was a son, He had to learn obedience uh, through what He suffered. Was there ever a time that Jesus was not obedient? No, that's not what this verse is talking about. What this is talking about is Jesus had to really learn what it costs to be obedient. Jesus learned what it ultimately cost Him to remain obedient to the Father, and it was through suffering. Uh, and being made perfect, uh, He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Underline that word eternal. Uh, that is one of the major uh, kind of comparisons that you'll see as we go through this study. Anything associated with Jesus is eternal. But you have the comparison of the high priest that was temporary. And so Jesus is the source of eternal salvation to all those who what? Obey Him. There it is again. You have to be obedient. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, here is an introduction to this character Melchizedek. And it is somebody that we're going to read about over and over as we go throughout these next few chapters. And so I really encourage you, delve into who Melchizedek is. Uh, we'll talk a lot about him at the beginning of chapter 7, but it's very important to understand 
who this Melchizedek is. Other than the book of Hebrews, there are only two other verses in the whole Bible that he has talked about. We already read one tonight in Psalm 110 verse 4, back uh, when he quoted that in chapter 5 verse 6. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so do your best to, to study up on this, this man, Melchizedek. Verse 11, about this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. So the author is really wanting to delve into this topic of Jesus' high priesthood and this, uh, how it relates to Melchizedek and how it's better uh, than the high priesthood of Aaron. But he can't do that at the moment. Why? Well, the subject is difficult, but why is it, why is it difficult? I would, I would like to tell you, yes, this is somewhat difficult material. But really, what was the problem? The people had become dull of hearing. Do you know what that dull of hearing means? They'd become lazy. How many of us in here are lazy when it comes to God's Word? See, this is where, for me, it gets real personal. How many of us put forth the effort that it takes to understand and know God's Word? Are we lazy? Are we sluggish? Notice what should have happened. Verse 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. You know what he just said to them? You need somebody to teach you the ABCs again. Imagine me as an adult without a tragic accident happening and hurting my brain somehow. Me being at this age and still having to learn how to write a sentence. Or still having to learn how to spell and form words. That's what's being said here. At this point in my life, I should be able to stand up and teach somebody how to spell a word and how to say their ABCs. At this point in these Christians' life, they ought to be able to be teachers. But they weren't. Why? Because they were lazy. How many of us are lazy? I wonder, I wonder, and I, I don't know this, I wonder, would we have more people to choose from to teach a class if we weren't lazy? I don't know that. I just wonder. You see, in order to not fall away, we can't be lazy and sluggish. We have to put forth the effort. It takes effort to understand God's Word. And that's what is required of us. So we can't be sluggish. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And so at this point in their life, they should have been mature, but they were not due to dull of hearing, because of laziness, because of a lack of effort. And so they were like babies. And so we're going to stop there tonight. I want to encourage all of us not to be lazy. Let's put forth the effort in it that it takes in order to understand God's Word. And so we'll pick up there next week and talk a little bit more about that.